My name is Philip Heedy. I'm a senior product manager for RJS Enterprise, and with me today I have Whit Matteau from Professional Services. So between the two of us, we're going to try to cover this vast area of best practices for layers and service types, and I'll try to explain what I mean by that here in just a second. What we will be doing is both speaking at somewhat of a conceptual level, what are the different service types, how do they behave, and so forth, but we'll also be doing some demos, and by we, I mean Wit will so show some of the really, really cool, amazing things that he's done within professional services with various customers. So with that, let's get started. We'll do a little bit of introduction of concepts, like I said. Technical foundation, what do we mean when we talk about layers and service types? What are the different, different options? We'll get into the concepts for the different services. What do they do? They draw maps, right? Well, not always. We'll be talking a lot about things like dynamic map services, feature services, cached map services, server-side rendering, client-side rendering, all these different options that ultimately affect the quality, the speed, the interactivity of your applications, regardless of whether those applications run in a browser, run in a native application on a desktop, or on a mobile device. There's lots of considerations. That's really the entire topic area that we're going to try to cover and arm you with enough information to make some really good choices. We'll also talk about how it's not just all about services under the hood. There's, of course, layers, but then there's this higher level concept of web maps, authoring those web maps and making the best use of everything. Now, we're going to talk about all the functionality that's available today. And by today, I actually mean July 17th, when RGS Enterprise 10.6.1 is also released. So we'll be talking about the latest and greatest functionality available. How many of you are running 10.5 or 10.6 today? This is my kind of crowd. <laughs> I love it. How many of you are running 10.3, 10.4? Okay. 10.2? Ten Arc IMS? No, I'll get oh, there. Okay. I'll, oh, sorry. Oh, believe me. I have fun. <laughs> okay, I, I usually have fun with this one. 10.1. <laughs> it's retired and we need to talk. 10.0. <laughs> 9X. And we'll do Arc IMS just because I haven't had anybody raise their hand on that one in no. years, thankfully. Okay, for those of you who are not yet on the latest release and come next week, that's all of you. <clears throat> what we'll talk about will hopefully also inspire you to go back to your, your home organizations and consider how to upgrade. Because some of the functionality we'll talk about comes in in the latest and greatest <clears throat> releases, including some very interesting pieces of functionality in 10.6.1. So I hope that'll inspire all of you. And if it's not you who makes the decision, you can talk to your IT administrators and convince them to upgrade. And with that, I'll hand it over to Wit to get us started. Thanks, Philip. Is the volume okay in the back for this mic? Well, great. So as Philip said, this is a pretty deep and vast topic. So we want to get into the meat pretty quickly, but I think it's important to set a little context. So we're going to do that up front here. Um, this is maybe a view of ArcGIS that you haven't seen before. I think it's a useful one to understand why we have these services and layers and this sort of division of labor within the platform. So at a really, really, really high level, conceptual level, this is how we view ArcGIS. Fundamentally, it's about connecting users with data in a meaningful way, in a way that helps them do what they need to do. So if you can think about this stack where you have data at the bottom and users at the top, ArcGIS has four main components or four main roles. At the lowest level is storage. There's different types of storage. This could be files, databases, blob stores, NoSQL databases, et cetera. On top of that is functionality. This is mapping, analysis, streaming, imagery, 3D, things like that. Funct it turns the data into a function. I can't, it's hard to see. This yellow one says information model. This is really about taking those those data and functionality and turning it into something meaningful and reusable that makes sense to users. Um, you can think of these as information products. And on top of that is a user experience, which is really where you take that information product and connect it to the user via something like an application. 
So this is like really high level how we think of ArcGIS. And this is actually how it maps to the various components of ArcGIS Enterprise. At the storage level, we have different data stores. And we're using that in sort of a generic sense, not necessarily specifically meaning the ArcGIS data store, but Philip will talk about that in a minute. The functionality is provided by GIS servers, or the ArcGIS server component of ArcGIS Enterprise. The information model is provided by Portal, a Portal for ArcGIS, component of ArcGIS Enterprise. And what connects the web maps and the web layers within Portal to users are applications. Applications are what the users actually interact with. And from an information perspective, in terms of what we publish when we talk about publishing content to ArcGIS, there's data. On top of that, there's services, REST-based web services. On top of that is web maps, web layers. And on top of that is applications. And so this is essentially why we have the structure that we have. And I think as we go through this, you'll start to understand how these various things can be published and, um, and how you can leverage them to really deliver the right data functionality experience to the right users. So as we get into this, some of the things to be thinking about, and so you might keep this in the back of your mind as we go through the presentation. Some of the key considerations when you're publishing these things are, who is your audience? What kind of device are they using? Are they a basic user? Are they an advanced user? Then, of course, the capabilities. What is it that they need to do? Gone are the days of putting everything that everybody could possibly want into one application. Uh, we have applications that are fit for purpose. So we need to be thinking about what, who is the user and what do they need to do. And then the rest of these are what we might call non-functional things, more IT considerations, performance, scalability, reliability, and of course, security being increasingly important as well. So just a couple examples of how different publication strategies differ from use case to use case. This is really high level. But if you're supporting a public facing, highly available user base and application, maybe an outage viewer in a natural disaster, that thing is probably very simple functionality wise, but needs to be extremely highly available and support large volumes of users. On the flip side, you might have a work group within your enterprise that's going out into the field and collecting data that's going straight back into your enterprise databases and information systems. It's editing, it's disconnected, it's a small user base, more advanced user base. These are two very different scenarios and your publication strategy, the layers and service types that you publish will be quite a bit different. And we'll revisit this concept at the end. So we're gonna get into the technical details in just a second. So as we do that, I would be thinking about this general approach. We wanna be, we really want, this is about IT and technical decisions meeting business requirements. So focus on the users, the functionality of the business. Start with the user, and then once you understand what the users need, I would then look at the data. So we're looking at the two ends of the stack, and the publication strategies is really how best to meet them. Um, and then this will change. I think it's also gone are the days where you study a user base and you release an application and it's out there for five, six years without any change. The world has changed, things are very agile and keep moving, and the technology does too. So it keeps us busy, but um, just think about, think you have to stay up with the technology and, and adjust over time. So with that, let's get okay. into the details. All right. Like we said, the technology always improves and, well, changes and improves, and a lot of that is, of course, based on feedback from customers like yourselves. The users saying, we want something that's faster, it works even better on a mobile device, I want it to be easier to get the data onto those devices, whatever it might be, and we keep adding new functionality to do that. So when we look at the conceptual components that Witt just went through, in this particular session, what we will be focusing on are those two middle pieces of the sandwich, right? We have the business requirements from the users at the top, we've got our data sets that need to support this. Now, how do we actually meet those requirements? How do we connect the two ends of the spectrum? That's what we'll be focusing on. So we'll talk a lot about the services in particular, and then we'll talk a bit about the map as well, because it's increasingly important within the RGIS stack. When we talk about publication clients, 
we mean really two specific applications. There's ArcGIS Pro and there's ArcMap, of course. And increasingly, there's a lot of newer functionality that exists primarily or exclusively within Pro. So when we talk about a modern publication client, it's really ArcGIS Pro that we're referring to. Many of the things that we talk about certainly also apply to services that you publish from ArcMap. But Pro is where all of the new exciting capabilities are coming in. Another really important thing to understand somewhat at the service level is this difference between what we refer to as hosted services and what we can colloquially refer to as more traditional services. And the primary distinction there is really who or what manages the underlying data, the lifetime of the data, and so forth. Where is that actually being stored? With hosted services, we, we think of it as being ArcGIS managed. The data is copied over to ArcGIS Enterprise as part of the publishing process. And that's where that data resides and is served out from. If you make a change to it, you're making a, a change to that copy of the data, not necessarily wherever it originated. On the flip side is user-managed data. And by user-managed, we mean that the data lives in some data store, some location that you are responsible for managing. So these are all your traditional enterprise geodatabases based on top of SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, and so on. These are your file geodatabases that are sitting on a file share somewhere. And who knows, maybe these are your shapefiles. Shapefiles, no? Good. We all have shapefiles. We all have shapefiles. Okay. So when we talk about data stores, we would mentioned this a little bit already. There's such a thing as the component of ArcGIS Enterprise called ArcGIS Data Store. That is the software component that ultimately stores the data in the ArcGIS managed model for those hosted services. By no means does this replace your user managed data sources such as your enterprise geodatabases and so forth. They happily coexist, so a part of your publication strategy is also understanding those two different options and choosing whichever one is best for your particular requirements. I touched on this a little bit, but we want to make sure that you, you keep this in mind as we talk about the different options. There are some key concepts to keep in mind. We talk a lot about map services. This is where the server gets a request, draws a map, just in time. The map has potentially never been drawn before in exactly the, the fashion that was just requested by the client. It gets drawn, sent back to the client, and then it's thrown away. Right? There's a bitmap, a PNG, something sent back to the client. It's just a picture. The, diff the, the other version of that is a feature service where the client is actually re receiving feature data. It's typically a JSON blob or some other variation thereof with the actual geometries. So we're streaming back data to the client, and the client then figures out how to draw it appropriately. And different clients have different capabilities for that. So why would you do that? Well, it's about interactivity. By having the actual geometries, the features on the client side, you can start interacting with them. You can start editing and do things like that. But then there's things like tiles, caching. Are you looking at a static snapshot because it's really fast, or are you looking at a dynamic view of the data as it looks right now. That may be less fast, but if you need access to the latest and greatest data, that's a trade-off you have to make. And then there's things like generalization. If we're sending the raw geometries and features down to the client, well, are we truly sending the raw geometries or are we sending a generalized version of it because it draws faster again? If it's just for visualization, that's often a trade-off you want to make. There's lots of different technical concepts sitting under the hood to keep in mind. All right, so I jumped ahead a little bit on this one, but when we look at features versus map images, the client makes a request that's typically, here's the extent I want you to draw, here's the size of the image I want you to draw, the resolution and things like that, and then the format. Do I want a JPEG, do I want a PNG, whatever the output image type is. And that's literally what gets sent back. And these are often very, very small. They can be transparent because they overlay with other images if they're PNGs. And there's subtleties like that. But often it's very small. Even if you're drawing millions of features, which by the way, pro tip, don't. But if you do, 
you're not getting all those millions of features back on the map. Or maybe you are, but you're getting a 10 kilobyte PNG with a whole bunch of dots on it. On the flip side, when a client requests features, it's requesting the geometry, the bounding box. Give me all the features in here so there's an extent again. But then it's also about the where clause and the outfields. Outfields is you specifying, or the application somehow specifying, what information do I need? If I'm getting feature data, do I really need all 100 attributes? Maybe not. Maybe I just need the geometry. Maybe I need the geometry and a few attributes. Maybe I only need attributes. Maybe I already have the geometry from somewhere else. So you get a lot of different options there. Ultimately, it's about server-side rendering, right? There's a standard small payload size of the res return response, but you don't get the interactivity. With features, you get lots of capabilities such as client-side rendering and the interactivity that goes along with it, but at the cost of higher response size. Next up are tiles. We can tile content. And this is when you're looking at different scales, whether it's small or large scale, we split it up into smaller tiles so we can chunk up the responses. We don't necessarily have to send all of the data in a single request, but we can chop it up. We can do this for raster and vector content, and it's often part of a caching workflow as well. The benefit of chunking things up like this is that we can make parallel requests, multiple requests at the same time, and we can start streaming in the data. It gives for a much more interactive user experience in many cases. Otherwise, you're waiting for five seconds for everything to come in, or you start seeing things pop in a little bit after, at a time. Makes, makes for what seems, in many cases, to be a faster application, even if, overall, it took just as long to draw the full thing. You at least started to see it draw. There's lots of, lots of little nuance to this as well. But when we're talking about caching, it's about taking a snapshot of the data at a certain point in time and potentially pre-generating all of those images if we're talking about a map service cache. You do a lot of upfront work. The server might be crunching for hours, days, weeks, depending on the type of service. We'll talk about that as well. But then once you've done that upfront work, the, the actual tiles that are sent back to the client, they just come in milliseconds, super fast. We mentioned generalization. There's a lot of different types of generalization, and you don't always necessarily have to understand the specific algorithms behind, behind the scenes, what's going on, but it is important to realize that this is happening because, again, if you're editing, well, you're probably not interested in editing a generalized version of it. However, if you're smart about how you configure your services, your layers, and your applications, you can get the benefit of a generalized response while you're looking at for just visualization, and then as you edit, switch over to the raw geometry and only have to bring down that one or a few features that you're actually interested in. So you can pre-generalize features by creating an entirely new derived product. Say you have your raw geometry sitting in a feature class somewhere. You create a new feature class, and you use that exclusively for visualization. Or you can do generalization on demand. You only have your one feature class with the actual features in it and the raw geometries. And as the clients are making requests, they ask for you to generalize it, and the server does the generalization just in time as part of the resp response to that request. What this boils down to is performance. A generalized response is smaller. It's faster to get to the client, downloading it over the network, and in a lot of cases, it's also a lot faster to draw on the client. And there's some really cool new things in 1061 in particular in this area that we'll be demonstrating later on. All right. Well, Thanks, Philip. So with some of those concepts under our belt, let's start looking at how they apply to specific types of services. Um, so as we look at all of the different service types that ArcGIS Enterprise supports, we see these as being the four main ones that support 2D mapping, um, especially around vector data. Now, there's another set of services that still fall into the mapping and visualization category, 
including image services, which focus on imagery and other raster data types, including elevation, scene services, which focus on 3D visualization, and stream services provided by GeoEvent Server that provide real-time pushing of features to clients over things like WebSockets. Um, in addition to those, there's this whole slew of other services that go beyond just visualization, including things like geocoding and different types of analysis services, as well as more specialized and even domain-specific service types. Now, for the purpose of today, we're just going to focus on the top, the four in the top left, dynamic map services, tiled map services, vector tile, and feature services. Those are the main ones that come into play for 2D uh, mapping and visualization of vector data. We just aren't going to have time to cover the rest, so we're going to focus on those. I think probably most of you have interacted with one or more of those four, so hopefully we'll get, get, some, get some value out of that. So let's, let's jump in. So dynamic map services. How many folks used MapQuest like 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, okay, all right. This is the original web mapping type. This is what ArcIMS provided. Um, this, is, this goes way back. This is sort of the original. It is, as Philip said, supports map images. So this is about server-side rendering and returning a map image to the client. So in the context of ArcGIS Enterprise, this is what powers the map image layer that we experience in the portal. This type of service is only available in ArcGIS Enterprise. Um, this is not available as a service type in ArcGIS Online, and it only works with user-managed data. So there's no hosted dynamic map service. This connects to your traditional uh, data stores like uh, enterprise geodatabases. So this does server-side rendering, as Philip said. So this is drawn on the server, which makes for a fairly small payload and reliably small. It's not going to fluctuate too much. Uh, it does support dynamic layers and dynamic rendering, meaning that the client can actually specify in the request how it wants things to be rendered and if we want to add new layers to the map. It supports identify and query, and it supports a number of OGC standards as well, including WMS, which is really the OGC service type that's modeled around this type of service. So this is really the fail-safe option. It's been around for a long time, and as we'll see, I think increasingly we see things trending towards some of these newer service types. A lot of that is driven by the speed of our networks and the speed of our devices. However, this is still a good fail-safe option when you have very complex data that's not going to make sense to pass all the way to the client or if you're on constrained networks or users with constrained devices. So moving forward into the future a little bit, came along tiled cached map services. As Philip said, this is, again, this is rendered on the server, but essentially the world of your map is divided into standard regions and levels of detail or scales, and it's tiled. If you remember that pyramid view in Philip's concept, that's essentially what's happening here. Now, tiled map services in the context of ArcGIS Enterprise power what we call the tiled layer within your portal. As a matter of interest, and many of you I think probably already know this, this type of service is available in both ArcGIS Enterprise and ArcGIS Online. So ArcGIS Online provides tiled map services in the form of base maps, but you can also publish tiled map services to ArcGIS Online for your own data. In terms of the type of data that can power this, um, this can either uh, be published as a hosted or ArcGIS managed tile service, or you can create tiled map services going against your own data, user managed data in traditional stores like enterprise geodatabases. These are rendered on the server. These are basically pre-cooked images that are just handed off by your web server to the client. So it's very quick. It lends itself well to caching, things like proxy servers and stuff like that. And your browser can actually cache these things, which is why when you pan to the left and it loads a tile and you pan back to the right, your map doesn't redraw because it's actually cached on the client. Um, these can also be taken offline, which is an interesting, powerful capability as well. And this supports OGC standards like 
Web Map Tile Service, or WMTS. So this is a proven option. It's very fast. It, can, it scales very well. So when you have large groups of users and you need uh, very fast performance and your data doesn't change all that often, this is still a great option. So moving forward a little bit, now we're getting a little bit more recent. It was within the last two years or so that we've introduced vector tile services. Now, vector tile services are conceptually very similar to tiled map services, except what's cached and handed back to the client, the browser, is actually vector data, not a pre-cooked uh, image. But it's still cut up into these little tiles. You can think about these, these, these tiles, instead of being little PNGs, they're little packets of data that are shipped back to the client, and it's rendered then on the client side. That, I think, is one of the biggest differences as we compare vector tile services to uh, map, tiled map services. The process of publishing vector tiles does actually do generalization for you, which is a pretty good thing. It, as you go to different levels of detail, it will actually simplify or generalize the features for those levels of detail. It will also clip the features to tile boundaries, which actually does come with some cost. It makes it then difficult to interact with that data on the client side. If I have a road segment that spans you know, several miles, that might be cut up into five different tiles. If I want to query that road segment, it becomes more difficult on the client because it's actually cut up into five pieces and would need to be reconstructed. Um, vector tile services, though, do allow you to take data offline. And as we look at comparing vector tile services to map services, I think this is something to be thinking about. The vector tile services are much, much smaller than tiled map services, especially as you get into very detailed maps. So this is, this is kind of the new kid on the block in a way in terms of service types. Um, and it does provide a nice alternative to tiled map services for uh, base maps and things like that, and also uh, feature services, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But let's actually take a little bit of a deeper look Actually, before we do that, one other concept with vector tiles that I think is important to understand is this concept of overzooming. So if you imagine this pyramid that Philip had up when we were talking about tiling, when you do traditional tiled map services, every if you imagine that as like a three-dimensional cube kind of in that pyramid, every one of those cells at every one of those levels of detail need an image or the browser's not gonna know what to do. It'll just render a no data tile or something like that. Because it's an image, the browser can't really stretch it. It's not gonna look very good if you try to stretch this image. But with vector data, we can actually overzoom that because now the browser has a sort of a, a geometric representation of that feature and it can continue to make it look sharp and crisp even as you zoom in and that feature was coming at a higher level. So this image kind of gives you an idea of how it's actually cooking tiles in a vector tile service. Over the ocean, it doesn't actually cook all the tiles you need because there's not a lot of feature data. Even if I were to zoom in to Coron off the coast of Coronado, my map is gonna look just fine because it got maybe whatever few features it had in there from a higher level of detail and it's able to present a good representation of that on the client. This is what actually makes vector tile services a lot smaller in a lot of ways, is because we can cache tiles more intelligently, only what we need and where we need them. And this is all baked into the vector tile publishing process. So let's take a quick look at map services compared to vector tile services. Was three. Bear with me one moment. There we go. All right. Can you see? Yeah, that one's not great. Let's switch to a different base map. Here we're in ArcGIS Online, but this could be my portal map viewer in ArcGIS Enterprise. I'm looking at 
my base map gallery. The ones that are presented here by default are tiled map services. And you can see as I zoom into the map, it updates very quickly. And sometimes you can even see those individual tiles load, but because these are so small and efficient, the browser can load them before I can actually visually see them update. But these are just images. And actually, if I were to take a little look behind the scenes as I'm panning around, I can see all of these are just JPEGs, just my browser loading JPEGs. Now, vector tile are a little bit different. Here we have a new application that's in beta called the Vector Tile Style Editor. And this actually allows me to change the rendering of vector tiles on the client. That means Esri published these vector tile services once, and me as a consumer of that get to change the way that it looks. And that's only possible because it's providing data to the client and the client is doing the rendering. So here we're looking at the same kind of base map except this one is a vector tile service. And I can actually start generating random colors and changing the rendering of my map. Well, that's a little much. Let's see. <laughs> so Russian roulette here with the... All right, that's still a little hideous, but we'll go with that. Um, th this is a cool application you can find. It is in beta, and it will eventually be made available for ArcGIS Enterprise as well. The idea here is to show that what's coming to the client is actually vector data. Now, if I were to look at this, what's happening is it's sending back these things called PBFs. You don't really need to worry too much about that, except actually it may be of interest. PBFs are basically a binary format. It's Google protocol buffers. It's an efficient way of packing binary data into something that can be sent over the web. And then on the client side, it knows how to unpack it. So they're very efficient, they're binary. If I were to look at one of these, it's not gonna make a whole lot of sense, but it makes sense to the client. It can unpack this and then it gets the clipped features that it can render on the map. So then if I were to go save this, um, uh, where is that? Save my crazy base map. I'll save that style. Now the style properties of this are actually saved in the tiled layer that resides in, in this case, ArcGIS Online, but in ArcGIS Enterprise, it res will reside in your portal. So Philip's gonna talk a little bit more about the web layers shortly, but this is an interesting concept here that we're starting to scratch the surface on that, um, the service is providing the data, the rendering rules are actually outside of the service and stored in the layer. My client gets that and applies them at runtime. So if I then go back to ArcGIS Online, my content here, I have a tiled layer for my crazy base map and I will get that map just like I created it in my vector tile style editor here within the that's map lovely viewer. Bit. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so that's a little comparison between traditional tiled map services and vector tile services. And now we'll go back over here. So on to feature services. How many folks are working with feature services today out of curiosity? Okay, great. As Philip said, this essentially returns data. I think of this sometimes as almost like a SQL query type thing. You know, it's providing a where clause, a spatial geometry as a spatial filter, and then it's telling me what outfields I want, which is kind of like your columns at the beginning of a select SQL statement. What's interesting and what's, you know, the direction that feature services are moving is actually to support more of what we might think of as feature tiles. So instead of as I zoom and pan the map, it sends one request for every zoom and pan and it gets all of that data. The, the browser and increasingly the server start requesting and acknowledging that the data is being returned back in tiles. It doesn't mean that it's pre-cached or pre-cooked tiles, but the client, the browser, instead of requesting one, requests several. And the benefit of that is that 
we can support caching. The browser now caches those tiles, which means, again, if I pan to the left, it might fetch a couple tiles worth of feature data. I pan back to the right, it doesn't need to request any data because the browser has actually cached that on the client. It provides a very nice experience. So the feature service powers the feature layer or the table items in Portal for ArcGIS. Um, these services are available in ArcGIS Online as well as ArcGIS Enterprise. And in the context of ArcGIS Enterprise, you can have feature services connecting to your user managed data stores like the Enterprise Geodatabase, or you can publish hosted feature services that are managed by ArcGIS, where your data is stored in the ArcGIS data store. There's a lot of powerful capabilities, and we'll actually show a few of these in just a minute, with feature services because it actually has a representation of the data on the client. It can render it on the client, it can support identify query operations, and it can actually now support querying on the client, which is pretty cool. I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. It does do on-demand generalization. There's actually a couple different types there. That is an important concept. We'll touch on that in just a minute as well. You can edit feature services. You can take feature services offline via the feature service sync capability. And these support OGC standards as well. For those of you that are working in a um, OGC sort of environment with high interoperability requirements. I would say that feature services are essentially the current standard default for dynamic operational layers and environments where you need to edit feature data. You have data that's changing very often and taken out into the field. They're really the most flexible in a lot of ways, but it can come at some penalty, especially when you have very complex data, very high throughput or user needs. Um, but we're putting a lot of effort into making feature services faster and faster, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Now, as WIT gets set up, part of what's going to be shown here is actually what's coming with 10.6.1 as it releases next week. So there's some really cool new features. But I don't want to get your hopes up if you go back home and try the, the same thing on your servers and you don't see the same behavior. Upgrade. Oh, no. <laughs> nice. All right. You can see it in ArcGIS Online if you want to experience yes. the difference. But yeah, it's a capability of... If, if, you, if you think of the many different layers, right? We talked about the data, the services, and the map. There's a lot of things that need to line up when we introduce new functionality. So what's happening at 10.6.1 is that we're introducing some new features at the service level where the JavaScript API and some of the other APIs have actually already had support for it for a little while as the services and online ship with this feature enabled a few releases back. But now it's coming to enterprise as well, which means everything lines up and you can start seeing the, the great behavior that we're looking for. Thanks. It's really hard to see this it's looking quite washed out. I need to be going with more bold colors in the future, I suppose. But um, what we're looking at here is a map of counties. We're starting here in the Palm Springs area. Uh, I have my Chrome developer tools up here. What I wanted to show you, this is a traditional feature service and feature layer. I'm going to zoom out to the point where I'm looking at all counties in the United States. And I'm sorry, let me do this in an incognito window so you can really get the experience. <laughs> so there's really no pre-caching here. So I'm going to start zooming out. Okay, things are loading quickly. You can kind of see it loading up in tiles. We're still good here. We're maybe looking at 500 counties. Now we're getting up to a few thousand counties, you see how it starts to get sluggish in loading those. I'm gonna zoom out to the continental US and okay, it's taken a little time, right? Now, if I start trying to pan the map, this is hard to get without doing this, but I can feel the browser getting slow. We're drawing a lot of features here. There's a lot of data. If I switch over to Chrome Developer Tools, I just transferred it may be hard to see, 26.6 26 megabytes of data from the server to my browser. So this is not practical for a lot of use cases. But this isn't really like a lot of data, it's the counties in the United States. This is a reasonable map that you might want to draw. Now, there's a new capability that we were talking about in 10.6.1 and in the JavaScript API. There's actually two parts of this. 
We're introducing something we're referring to as feature tiling, or no? Quantization and feature tiling. Quantization yeah. and feature tiling. So we talked about generalization. There's a new technique that's in 1061 called quantization yeah. that is very efficient at taking, in many cases, complex geometries and reducing it down to just the vertices and the pieces that need are needed to represent that data in whatever my display is. So it's just giving me the data that I need. So now let's take a look at that. The other thing that's happening is we've, in the JavaScript API, added WebGL-based capabilities to power the feature layer. So we've got much more efficient transfer of geometries from server to client, and the client has gotten better at dealing with lots of data. So now let's try this again. This is with the quantization and WebGL capabilities. I'm going to keep zooming out. There we go. So it loaded all that data. My browser is super snappy here, has no problem handling that. And if we look, I just transferred 410 kilobytes. That's about a 50 order of magnitude difference. So you can imagine this now lets you deliver more data with more interactivity over constrained networks, more data. You, there are stronger requirements on the devices, though, because WebGL is really needed to make that work on the client very well. So do you think that's interesting? All right, good. WebGL. It's a, uh, I guess it's a standard that's supported now in most web browsers. Yes, so when we say most web browsers, think not IE. <laughs> Most popular web? No. Yes. Yeah. Um, so a couple other things that are pretty cool about um, feature services. So I mentioned that you can do querying. Well now, so this is a map that downloaded as well. I'm viewing census tracks. And it's a pretty quick map. It loads my features just like I saw in the other thing, in the other demo. But look, I can actually now query on the client. This is census data, population by gender and age. You can see the chart in the lower left-hand corner. As I move this viewport around, it's updating in real time. There's actually no requests going back to the server. It's doing all of these queries on the client side. So this is one of the benefits you get with feature services. Increasingly, we can do more and more with the feature data on the client. That provides a better experience for users and removes load from your server, actually. Um, and also, with the power of WebGL and the JavaScript API, we can do things like changing rendering on the client side in real time. So here's, again, all counties in the United States. I can adjust the rendering here, and you can see how fast it updates pretty much instantaneously. So a lot of things are happening. The, the, our, our machines are getting better. The browsers are getting better, networks are getting faster, and ArcGIS Enterprise is getting better, taking advantage of that. And I think we see more and more applicability of feature services as all of those things change. One other thing about feature services and feature layers that I think is just important to be aware of, um, we often think about feature services. Um, a feature service is actually like a container for layers. So you might have census counties, census tracts, census block groups as different layers within a feature service. In a dynamic map service, you have the same concept. You have census counties, census tracts, census block groups. As we look, and Philip will get, talk about this in just a moment, web layers within your portal, you can actually create a feature layer that points to a layer in a dynamic map service. Now, when you're registering that in portal, you don't give it the slash map server URL. You would give it slash map server slash layer ID. But when you do that, it actually starts to behave pretty much like a feature layer, even though it's coming from a map service. But the map service does not support editing. It doesn't support offline feature sync. And there's a few other nuances here as well. But let's say, for example, you don't have an enterprise geodatabase. You don't have needs for like feature services, offline editing, things like that, but you want to take advantage of the feature layers, I would look into this idea of actually registering your layers in your map service 
as feature layers, and you need to we need to register them individually. So that let's get into the geo information model. Yes. So this is a, a really, really important concept. For a, a, a great many years, we've been very services centric, right? Because that's really the only option we had for a long time. If you were creating your own custom applications, you were instantiating layers inside of a, let's say a JavaScript based app, and then you pointed to the underlying service. And there was really a one-to-one -one, and we didn't distinguish too much between the two. But now we start having a lot of capabilities such as what Wit was showing before also with styling as part of the layer definition itself. So instead of recreating those styles, those definitions on, on the layers within every single application, what we've done with the introduction of the portal, both within ArcGIS Online and the Enterprise portal in ArcGIS Enterprise, we've essentially abstracted that out into the geo-information model. And that's what I'll talk about here. So the geo-information model is this higher level of abstraction on top of the many different service types and data types that we support within ArcGIS. We support lots of different types of data. We've talked primarily about vector data here in this session, but we also have imagery, tabular data, 3D data, real-time data, and so on and so forth. When we talk about that data at this higher level of abstraction, we refer to them as web layers. Web layers because they're all being served out over a network protocol like HTTP, HTTPS. We're all being served over the web. Doesn't mean it's on the open internet necessarily. It can be closed networks as well. Those layers are then used within web maps. And think of these web layers and web maps and web scenes in the case of 3D as essentially your configuration files for all of your applications. Right? This is a common information model that anything that builds on top of the S3 JavaScript API and runtime SDKs understands. That means all of the applications that Esri has built, Collector for ArcGIS knows how to load a web map and show all of the layers within it. Operations Dashboard knows how to load a web map. The same web map that you would be using in Collector. It's also partner applications. Like I said, anybody who's built an application using the Esri APIs and SDKs they know and understand this common language. And of course, that also means your custom applications if you're building them. It means you don't have to redefine the same thing over and over again. It means you can still take advantage of this just in time ap applying a style if you've modified a vector tile base map. You can save that once and reuse it across anything that knows how to talk to vector tile layers. So in practice, that means that we have this concept of a web map. It contains operational layers. These operational layers, these are the ones we refer to as web layers. There's different types of web layers. There's the map image layer, there's the tile layer, there's the feature layer. Those were the things that Witt was just talking about and demonstrating. And this is where it gets interesting. You can have a feature layer at this level that's pointing to a feature service under, hood, un, under the hood, or like Witt said, a map service. A layer from a map service can also be thought of as a feature layer. You get that same interactivity. You're doing queries against the geometries and attributes as opposed to getting images back. But it's simply the equivalent of a read-only feature layer when you power it using a map service. But if all you're looking for is visualization, that's perfectly acceptable. And you can create feature layer items that point to individual layers within individual map services, yes. The next thing in the web map is, of course, a base map of some kind. This base map is, in most cases, either a cached map service or one of these vector tile layers. Doesn't really matter where it comes from or what type it is. It might be coming from Esri via ArcGIS Online, or it might come from your own base map services that you've cached and created. And then there's all the properties that go along with this. This is where you're customizing the look and feel, which layers are turned on and off by default, the rendering options for the map, the pop-ups, the labels, all of these different things stored as a single item within the portal that can then be consumed by all of these different applications. So in practice, we take this web map, we have our web layers, and there's GIS services powering them under the hood. The GIS services are ultimately where the data is coming from, feeding in to this. So the first thing that happens is that a client 
connects to the portal and gets the information product, the web map itself. This is the specification of what do I need to load? What am I supposed to be looking at? Once the client gets that, it starts sending requests to the underlying services. Now I know where the services are, the URLs, and depending on how many layers are in the web map, the client starts sending off two or more requests. Depending on the layer types, you might see many requests if we're doing tiling, like what showed before. We start seeing a lot of requests for a single layer. So how does that map over to our conceptual model from the beginning? We had data, we had services, now we have our layers and the web map on top. We might have a single data set in the traditional model. And then depending on how you want to look at that data set, in the past it was very common to publish out multiple services. One service might have all of the data, no where clause. And it was tightly controlled with some kind of security because only a few people should see all of the data. But then if you wanted another view of that same data, maybe you published out a separate service with a where clause of some kind, limiting, filtering the results. And then you could go on and on, publish many different views on top of the same data. And this is very powerful, right? You get different views for different people for different applications. And in the portal, these would all become individual web layers. Each one of the services has a corresponding layer. You could then create additional layers with additional properties on top. So the downside to this approach was you had a lot of services. And services can get expensive. Everybody's nodding. You should come to the road ahead session tomorrow. You have some good, good things coming. Expensive infrastructure, expensive resource wise, in, right? In, in terms of memory footprint is often where it, it, it comes down to because each service is backed by service instances, memory on the server, and this is often something that gets tightly controlled because server administrators, well, they don't like when their machines start running out of memory. That's a bad thing. What the geoinformation model and these newer capabilities allows us to do is in many cases collapse that down. Instead of having to publish separate services for every single variation, every single filter, you can publish a single service and apply the filtering at a higher level. Apply the filter inside of the web layer in the portal. That's where you add your where clause. They're all being powered by the same straw into the underlying database, right? You're sucking data through that same one service and then as you make that request, you say, well, by the way, filter it this way. You don't always have to create separate services for separate things. If you want to change the styling, the filtering, all of that can be done at the web layer level. That's a very, very powerful idea that really gets lost if we just keep doing the same thing we've been doing since ArcIMS, potentially. I haven't used our IMS for a very long time. I think that was a nice touch. How many of you used IMS? All right. Old school crowd. Yes. I like it. All right. So in practice, what might that look like? We might have a Wells data set. We publish a single Wells service, and now we start adding our layers on top. One of those layers might have a certain subset of data. Another one of those layers might be showing a different subset of the data. And we can keep going. And we could also have one of those layers simply show everything. All depends on what your specific needs and requirements are. But making smart use of the layers at the portal level can really, really improve your backend infrastructure. But it requires you to think things through all the way from where is my data, who's publishing, how are they publishing it, and how are you as the users creating the layers, maybe that's the developers, everybody who's involved in that whole workflow needs to work together and plan this out ahead of time. A place where this really comes to shine even more, I think, is with something like smart mapping. If you've seen any of the demos over the past couple of years since we introduced smart mapping, this is the idea of smart intelligent defaults. When you go into the portal's map viewer, you add a layer and you can start styling it with very little effort. Now, Ken and John, who did the previous session here in this room on cartography, they have been very involved in this 
They are professional cartographers. I am not. I am very much not a professional cartographer. But smart mapping still makes me look good. But how does smart mapping actually work? Smart mapping works by applying rendering definitions at the layer level, at the feature layer level. So I can take any random feature class, publish it out as a feature service or a map service, create a new feature layer inside of my portal using smart mapping, I can make it look good. I can use all of the powerful capabilities, including the new predominance mapping, creating maps that I would have absolutely no chance of authoring before. And you don't have to do anything other than having published out the service and then applying lots of different styles, lots of different look and feels on top. And smart mapping is one example of a really great way of doing that. All right, so we've talked about a lot of different things, services, smart mapping. Yeah. How do I we wrap it all up? Yep. We got about five minutes left. We wanted to take the last five minutes and kind of step back out from all these details and look at a couple examples and sort of a strategy for applying all this information. So a couple quick examples. Again, this is the idea of looking, we start by looking at what is the use case, what are the requirements, and what is the actual content that I'm looking to present. This is one example. It's a um, web-based visualization where I'm looking to present weather data. And in this case, I want to see weather data on imagery. So how might I approach this? Well, I probably am looking at two different types of services. One for the base map. This is imagery, so I can't do vector tiles. So I'm going to do tiled map services for serving out raster tiles for the imagery. And then for the weather data, which is moving, obviously, very quickly, and it's fairly complex, I'm going to use dynamic map services to render that on the client. Every time the weather updates, Every time I make a request, I will get the latest weather data, and it will present a very simple, small image. Not simple, I guess, small image on the server that's delivered to my browser. So this is probably the best application of different service types for this particular use case and this type of data. Now let's look at another example. In this case, we're talking about enterprise. I have my uh, field workers going out into the field to collect utility data. They need streets as a base map, and they're visualizing as well as collecting fairly complex data out into the field, in some cases without internet connectivity. So probably the right application of service types in this particular example would be to present the vector tile services for the base map because they're smaller and I can take them offline into the field. I can pre-cook vector tile package for street maps for my entire service area, preload those on the devices or maybe the users download them from time to time. And for the operational data, the utilities, again, that's edited, editing and needs to be taken offline. So feature services is really the best option for me. And this is gonna be a mobile offline use case. So I probably have an iOS or Android device or some other device that's working with a local tile cache as well as a local runtime database which houses my features and periodically syncs via the feature service sync capability. So it's another example of how you can put these things together for a specific use case. We often think about how you do this as creating a publication strategy. Um, it's not something that you need to study for months on end, but it definitely needs to be thoughtfully designed. And this is kind of tying it back to that approach in the beginning, um, but in a more practical way. Really, your publication strategy is gonna be driven by both business, primarily business, but also IT requirements, the use case. What is the user tolerance for performance? Everybody wants the fastest possible experience. And I think that's generally true, and it's increasingly true, um, but Performance may come at costs or other trade-offs. So look at what is, the, what is the real performance you have to meet for your particular user type. Um, the data, the frequency at which your data is updated is a key consideration in picking these different service types. The network, the client, this can think be, be thinking about how can I use feature services or not. A lot of it will depend on the network bandwidth, the client, uh, device and the speed of the clients. Um, and really the knobs and dials you have to tweak as you look at your publication strategy are selecting the right service type to publish, 
whether or not to cache, cache things in advance, cache on demand, um, using and applying generalization. Again, this is, Philip alluded to this smart decision about if we're doing visualization, then we, we can probably use generalization, but if you're switching to editing, you probably don't wanna be editing a generalized feature. And then as Philip said, making smart use of the different web layer and web map options so that you get the best of both worlds. You can provide the right content to the right user without having you know, hundreds of services chewing up RAM in your ArcGIS server. And if we think about kind of a formulaic approach to this, you know, start by looking at the business, the use case, understand the users, then gather the IT requirements. Again, these are things like security, scalability, you know, service level agreement or SLA. Um, and then I would typically work from the bottom up. What are the data and architecture pieces needed to support those? Then what is the right service type? What are the right layers and such in the geoinformation model? And as I said, this isn't like a necessarily a long study. It needs to be thoughtfully done and it needs to be constantly revisited for two reasons. The technology is moving very fast, but also users are increasingly moving fast. The business is going to demand change faster and faster. So we need to always be reevaluating and adjusting over time. So just to leave you with a few key takeaways here. A good publication strategy is really important. A lot of the user's experience is going to depend on delivering the right content in the right way um, for what they need to do. Um, again, I've said this probably enough, do focus on the business and the end user and the consumer, what they need. We're really about technologies there to support the business, not really the other way around. We didn't really talk too much about the, the applications for publishing. Um, but increasingly, I would be trying to use Pro as your primary application for publishing. Uh, for example, vector tiles, you can really only publish from Pro. Um, this idea of using the geoinformation model, I think, is going to become increasingly important. Um, the capabilities of the clients and the configuration, if you will, that can be stored in layers and maps is only going to increase. Um, so it's it's definitely, if you're not using those capabilities a lot right now, I would suggest taking a look at that. Um, we are seeing a trend towards doing more and more on the client by way of vector tile services and feature services. That's not to say that those meet all of the requirements. It's just trending in that direction, and I think that will continue as networks and devices and such get better and faster, and the user requirements are become more and more demanding. Um, and just lastly, to touch on something Philip mentioned at the beginning, this is a complex topic. It's fraught with nuance, um, and it changes very quickly. So uh, hopefully this was useful to you, but we weren't, it's impossible to really cover all of the details. So please do, um, do your homework on this topic. There's a lot of good information out in the documentation, and um, it changes a lot with the technology. So please revisit it from time to time. Thanks, we ran a couple minutes over, but Philip and I will hang out if you have questions. Thank you so Thanks. much for coming.